Hey guys and welcome back to my channel for another history video where today we're going to be talking about the Tulsa race riots also occasionally known as the Greenwood Massacre or the Black Wall Street Massacre in which a race riot broke out. This is something that happened 100 years ago from May 31st to June 1st 1921 and in the aftermath it was essentially buried by the city of Tulsa, Oklahoma. For decades, very few people had any idea that this had even happened, with only becoming more publicly known after a 2001 report by the Oklahoma Commission. Despite this, the exact events which actually led to this riot are still pretty hard to pin down. Whilst we can get a basic idea of how it all came to be, the specific details have long been lost to history. Of course, this video is sponsored by Magellan TV, who I have a long-standing sponsorship with. They're a streaming service dedicated purely to documentaries and as you may know by now, each month I like to make a couple of recommendations that I think you should watch, starting this week with Murdered Online. This is a short documentary about the sad death of Rosalind van der Viver, who was kidnapped after getting a new job at a local store. Rosalind was left for dead after a horrific ordeal and managed to tell a friend about what happened before eventually succumbing to her injuries. The four men involved have never been brought to justice, but someone out there must know something that could lead to huge leaps in this case. They're looking for that one person to come forward with information. This documentary is basically like one of my videos in documentary form. And the second documentary I want to mention is very relevant to today's video. We have Race for Justice. This is an incredible documentary telling the story of how three women came together in their ongoing struggle for acceptance and justice. We have an attorney from Chicago, a high school teacher in Manhattan, and a grieving daughter whose father was killed by police in Staten Island. All with very different lives but similar stories. They fight for acceptance and justice in a very rocky political landscape, discussing race and police brutality. Magellan TV have everything from true crime, science, history, nature and everything in between with new programmes and weekly be watched anywhere on your TV, laptop and mobile. It's compatible with Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Google Play and iOS and loads of the programmes are available in 4K as well. If you love my channel then honestly I cannot stress enough how much you'll enjoy Magellan TV and I'm really happy to announce that my viewers can now take advantage of an exclusive offer, 30% off an annual membership. That's an entire year of a catalogue of over 3,000 documentaries with new ones added all the time for less than $3.50 a month. Simply click on the link in the description to claim your discounted annual membership today. And that includes those of you who are already signed up to Magellan TV, just let your subscription lapse and then you can claim this offer for yourself. We'll begin this story long before the events of 1921 because to truly understand what went on here we need some of my favourite thing yet again, context. After the 13th amendment passed in 1865 ending slavery, black enslaved people in the south found themselves truly free for the very first time, but that didn't mean that life was going to be easy for them from there on out. Once emancipated, the people were just set free with no money, no land and no education. Only a minority were either able to move themselves up to the middle class or use skills to build businesses of their own. How were these newly free black people going to feed themselves and their families, build lives for themselves in a country that was going to do everything it could do to prevent this? In an attempt to find work, many black people found themselves turning to sharecropping, which I did see described on the internet as legal slavery. Black people sought out jobs and white people sought out labourers. Sharecropping was a system in which the landlord allows a tenant to use some of their land and their equipment in exchange for a share of the crop. Tenants would have to work to provide the biggest harvest they could and they'd have to remain tied to this piece of land they were working on. This wouldn't provide very much economic freedom and black people just wanted out of this cycle. They didn't want to have to be working for white people working on the land. They just didn't want it anymore. One of these people was O.W. Gurley who knew his chances of success in the South as a black man were slim. He managed to get a decent job in the US Postal Service, but he wanted more than that. 
So when the Great Oklahoma Land Rush happened in the late 1800s, an event in which the previously restricted or unassigned land of Oklahoma was now essentially up for grabs, Gurley claimed a plot. Gurley was very ambitious and saw Oklahoma as a new land of opportunity for black Americans and from there he worked his way up in the community. According to Forbes.com he ran for county treasurer, he was made principal of the local school and opened a very successful general store. By the turn of the century he heard about oil fields in another nearby town of Tulsa, another opportunity. So Gurley sold his store and his land in Perry and moved 80 miles to Tulsa, where he bought a large amount of land on the north side of the train tracks. There was literally nothing there, but he had a dream and a vision. He started to map out a city for black people who were looking for opportunities. He split up his land into different lots, both residential and commercial, and built a grocery store on an avenue that he named Greenwood. As Gurley expected, soon sharecroppers from across the south began to work their way to Tulsa and Greenwood began to become a community. And this wasn't just a nice community, it thrived thanks to the access to oil and soon it began to rival areas of the biggest US cities with more than 35 blocks. Greenwood became a town within a town that had everything from grocery stores to theatres to private transportation networks. These sharecroppers were able to build themselves up to become doctors, lawyers, millionaires within just a couple of decades of being in Greenwood. The aforementioned Forbes article, which is entitled The Bezos of Black Wall Street, quotes Tulsa-based historian Hannibal B. Johnson as saying, Greenwood was perceived as a place to escape oppression, economic, social, political oppression in the Deep South. It was an economy born of necessity. It wouldn't have existed had it not been for Jim Crow segregation and the inability of black folks to participate to a substantial degree in the larger white dominated economy. I really want to stress here just how successful Greenwood became within Tulsa. It was one of the most successful black economies in American history, even to this day. Hence how it got nicknamed Black Wall Street. There was money everywhere and like I'm not talking a little bit wealthy, I'm talking the biggest, most grand mansions in Tulsa, the nicest cars, luxury shops, department stores, churches, they had their own banks, restaurants, their own hospital, hotels, pools, even had its own newspaper. There were even people living in Greenwood who owned their own private planes. And it was thanks to the strict Jim Crow laws of the South, laws which were particularly harsh in Oklahoma, that these black people were able to keep this wealth to themselves. There were racial segregation laws that prevented them from shopping and spending their money elsewhere. So any month spent was just going back into the Greenwood economy and it just went from strength to strength. By the time of the riot slash massacre, more than 10,000 black people were living in Greenwood. All of which lays the foundations nicely for us to now share the actual events of the Tulsa race riots. Now please just bear in mind that as I said at the beginning of this video, a lot of the actual events here have been lost to history. And whilst we can piece together a good amount of the story, we don't have all the details. But the story goes somewhat as following. It was the 30th of May 1921 when a 19-year-old black man called Dick Rowland entered the lift in the Drexel building in the white part of Tulsa on the other side of the railway tracks to Greenwood. Very little record exists of Dick Rowland. He got the hell out of Tulsa shortly after these events and disappeared completely for the most part. But it's thought that his birth name may have been Jimmy Jones and he changed his name later in life after he was informally adopted by the Roland family, he was an orphan. Although even all that is kind of speculation and educated guess. Dick worked as a shoe shiner on Main Street, but due to segregation laws, he couldn't just use any toilets. He had to use toilets specified for black people. The closest of which was on the top floor of the Drexel building at 319 South Main Street. Sarah Page was a 17-year-old white woman who worked as a lift operator in the Drexel building. 
It was actually Memorial Day that day, a holiday. And it's thought that usually neither Dick nor Sarah should have been working, but they both ended up doing so because it was a holiday. The next few days would have been very different for Tulsa had neither of them been working. The accepted story of what happened goes as following. Dick needed to go to the loo, so he made his way to the Drexel building, where he had to catch the lift to the top floor to use the toilets. People who knew this building well said that the lift didn't stop level with the floor on the top floor, which likely caused Dick to trip as he walked in and fall into Sarah, or accidentally stepped on her foot or grabbed her arm. That's kind of the accepted version of events here, that he accidentally grabbed her. But another theory is that Dick and Sarah were romantically involved and they had a lover's quarrel that day. But we don't know that for sure. What is universally accepted is that Dick Rowland would not have sexually assaulted Sarah. Everyone who knew him said that that would not have been his intention. He probably just accidentally fell into her. Although sexual assault is obviously always a very bad thing, the stakes would have been even higher back in 1921 for Dick, a black man, assaulting Sarah, a white woman. When Dick fell into Sarah or whatever happened that day, she screamed out and was overheard by a clerk at Renberg's, which was a clothing store in the building. The clerk reported hearing Sarah scream and then seeing Dick fleeing from the building as fast as he possibly could. Dick would have known there would be consequences for what he'd just done for tripping over and grabbing a white woman. He must have been terrified. This clerk is thought to have been the one who told the authorities of what happened. But it wasn't even really the authorities who escalated this. They questioned Sarah, but there's no written account of this, so we don't know for sure what she said but we do know that she clearly didn't think it was anything too sinister and the police certainly didn't think it was assault and Sarah didn't want to press charges. However, Dick was of course a black man and so was arrested at his home the next morning anyway and was jailed in the Tulsa County Courthouse possibly as a result of rumours spreading throughout town. An innocent arm grab, which would have been bad enough for a black man anyway, had turned into a sensational account of rape through gossip. The Tulsa Tribune, which was the local newspaper, heard this rumour, and that same day, in their afternoon edition, ran a front page article claiming that Dick had attempted to rape Sarah. The headline of the article actually read, Nab Negro for attacking girl in an elevator. An excerpt reads, He entered the lift, she claimed, and attacked her, scratching her hands and face and tearing her clothes. All of which we know is absolutely not true. But this article was intended to stir up discontent in the community. I mean, even the headline is shocking here. It almost reads as an order telling the public what to go and do which is very interesting. Rumour has it that there was another column in the same edition of the paper which was titled To Lynch Negro Tonight, just in case you had any doubts what they were getting at with the first article. This is a direct order, either telling the public to go and lynch Dick Rowland, or was spreading the word of an already planned lynching. However, this particular second article has been lost to history, all original copies of that paper were destroyed and not held in record, probably for obvious reasons. Even the relevant page is missing from the microfilm copy, so there's no way of knowing what this article said for sure or if it even existed. What we do know though is everything which has happened over the next couple of days was directly because of the Tulsa Tribune spreading this gossip. Actually, no, gossip doesn't seem like a strong enough word here, spreading this entirely false narrative for very racist reasons. The afternoon edition of the Tribune with these two articles was rolled off the presses by 3pm, and within hours there were rumours spreading throughout both the black and white communities that a lynching was about to take place. Whites began to gather outside the courthouse where Dick was being held just before sunset a crowd of hundreds of angry white people. At 8.20pm, three white men entered the courthouse and demanded that Dick be handed over to them, but they were refused. Whilst all of this is going on, the black community in Greenwood are trying to figure out how to best protect Dick from what they know is going to happen. They're not about to just sit back and watch as he gets lynched. 
So at 9pm, a group of 25 armed black men arrive at the courthouse themselves. They offered to help the authorities at the courthouse should the white mob attack but they were turned away, assured that Dick Rowland was safe and he wasn't going to be turned over. But as you can imagine, the arrival of a group of armed black men only angered the white men, who swiftly armed themselves as well if they weren't already. At this point, one group of white men even tried to break into the National Guard armory to get hold of the weapons inside, but they were forced to turn away. The situation was escalating by the moment. This crowd of white people were furious that a black man had dared try to rape a white woman, a rape which never even happened and even Sarah said to herself it wasn't assault, nothing happened, he just tripped up. But it doesn't matter because the newspaper spread this false narrative and people wanted to believe it. It's said that by 9pm the angry white mob outside the courthouse had reached nearly 2,000 people. And of course, it wasn't just men, there were women and even children there as well. The sheriff, Willard McCullough, and the police chief, John A. Gustafson, tried to talk the mob into leaving, but they weren't interested. So instead, McCullough organised deputies to protect Dick Rowland, standing around him in a circle on the top floor of the jail. And he even disabled the lift and put deputies on the roof with rifles. That is how bad this situation got. There were so many people outside that the sheriff knew he had to do something to protect Dick, otherwise Dick was going to end up dead. He told men at the top of the stairs to shoot any intruders on sight. And I suppose that's all something. And despite the police chief, who was separate from the sheriff, claiming that he did tell the mob to go home, he didn't actually bother to dispatch any of his own police force to go and help the situation. He just kind of went back to his office at police headquarters and left the sheriff to deal with it all. At 10 p.m., yet another group of black men, bigger this time, headed to the courthouse once again to offer to assist the sheriff's department. And again, they were refused. And it's at this point when it all fell apart. Tension outside was now at its peak, and as these black men were leaving the courthouse once again, a white man attacked one of them and attempted to disarm him. It's thought that in the struggle, a shot was fired, and it's not known whether it was accidental, intentional, or meant as a warning. But this was the beginning. As soon as this first shot rang out, the rest of the mob took it as their sign that shooting was now allowed. The mob immediately opened fire on the black men who returned fire. Within just seconds, more than 20 people, black and white, were dead. And from there, it just got worse. The black men, hugely outnumbered by the white, quickly retreated back to Greenwood over the railway tracks, with the white mob following closely behind. Heavy gunfire erupted along the way. At the police headquarters on 2nd Street, separate from the sheriff's office and the courthouse, nearly 500 white men were then sworn in as special deputies to control the situation. Rumour has it this deputised mob were instructed by police to get a gun and shoot a very racist word which I am not going to say. The whites were literally breaking into any store which sold guns and ammunition in an attempt to arm themselves as heavily as possible. And the police were joining in, there's reports of police literally handing out guns to white people to fight the black. By 11pm it was bad enough that members of the National Guard began to assemble at the armoury to figure out how to subdue the rioters, who by this point were out in the street in droves. White men began shooting black men on sight. One unarmed black man was chased down an alley and ducked into the Royal Theatre to escape, only was followed and murdered on the stage of the theatre. A white man was even killed by another group of white men who had mistaken him as black. By midnight, Dick Rowland was no longer the target of their anger. He was forgotten about for the most part. This was an anger against the black community as a whole. Analysis of the event and everything that led up to it years later suggested that there had long been unhappiness on the white side of town about how successful Greenwood had become. They simply just didn't like black people being more successful than them and that made them angry. The riot continued all through the night on May 31st to June 1st. 
Gunfire was exchanged across the railway tracks, not even stopping when an actual train came past. There were drive-by shootings in the black neighbourhoods with white people shooting randomly into homes they knew to be of black people. They didn't cross over into Greenwood just yet, they just went through the rest of Tulsa shooting into homes of black people. They didn't care if they were shooting men, women or children, young or elderly, it didn't matter to them, they just wanted to kill them. An elderly couple were shot in their homes, execution style, in the back of their heads. And by 1am, people had started to cross over into Greenwood and the fires started. Black homes and businesses all across Greenwood were targeted. And when the fire department arrived to put the fires out, the rioters just chased them off. By 4am, more than 24 homes and businesses had been torched to the ground. In the early hours, the Tulsa National Guard were officially called out to help. Of course, all the guardsmen were white. A team of 50 were dispatched to Greenwood where they were given a machine gun. Thank God this gun actually turned out to be kind of broken and could only fire one shot at a time. If not, a lot more people could have ended up dead here. The National Guard set up a skirmish line facing the Black District and began rounding up black civilians, getting them out of the hands of the mob and handing them over to the police. The governor, JBA Robertson, requested for state troops to be sent out to Tulsa. So at 5am, a train carrying 100 National Guard soldiers left Oklahoma City for Tulsa. People hoped that by daybreak the riots would calm down, but that was not to be the case. It wasn't actually until about 5am on the 1st that the white mob really began to flood Greenwood, finally stepping over the tracks in their hordes. Before that point, there were only a few. Black families had to either defend themselves or flee, literally dodging bullets as they went. It's even said that by this time, as many as six airplanes, all manned by white men, appeared overhead, people firing from them and dropping explosives. The mob on the ground broke into black homes and businesses in Greenwood, forcing any occupants out, where they were swiftly marched off to Convention Hall at gunpoint, where the black people were literally just being rounded up and taken. Anyone who resisted was shot. Homes were looted completely and then set on fire, entire streets up in flames and or destroyed. Any attempts the black community made to protect their homes and businesses was undercut by the police and National Guard, who, as I've already said, was just marching them off to be imprisoned. The white people weren't being punished or even so much as being disarmed. They were fine to continue doing what they were doing. The black people were being rounded up for their safety, but like... We all know that wasn't why. Martial law was officially declared by the governor at 11.30am on June 1st, but by that point the riots had pretty much died out. The whites hadn't slept all night and were beginning to head home, although some continued well past midday. But the black people no longer had homes to retreat to if they hadn't already been detained in protective custody. Now, under martial law, the National Guard began to disarm the white rioters and send them home if they hadn't already. That afternoon, 30 white men were arrested for pillaging. It was declared that by 8pm that night, order had been restored, but lives had been changed forever. 35 blocks of the city had been destroyed or burned or both. More than 800 people were treated for injuries and reports of death sat around 36 people, both black and white. That's what the Oklahoma Bureau of Vital Statistics reported at the time anyway. However, this number is widely regarded as being false. The state and the city didn't want to have to admit to the true extent of this massacre. Whilst even today we still don't know the true number of deaths that occurred, a later commission held by the state in 2001 estimated that the number was really anywhere between 75 and 300, and most believe it to be closer to the higher end of the scale. When black people began to return to their homes in Greenwood, they were actually lucky if the house was still standing. If it was still standing, it had been looted entirely. Nothing was left. And that's just the people who were still free. There were thousands of black people marched through the streets and taken to Convention Hall or McNulty Park where they were detained. They were then transported to the fairgrounds at Admiral Boulevard and Lewis Avenue. 
Even the next day, the National Guard was still out patrolling the countryside looking for Greenwood residents to pick up. Many had tried to escape the city entirely and a lot never returned. The detainees at the fairgrounds were given food, water and medical attention. And as the black hospital had been burned to the ground, they had to create a makeshift clinic for injured black people at the National Guard armory. They even had to commandeer some beds in the white hospital for the most injured, which I'm sure caused uproar in itself. There were estimated to be about 5,000 people at the fairground camp. The majority of the detainees were held for days or even weeks and were generally held until a white person had to turn up and vouch for them, generally employers who needed their employees. Once a black person had been vouched for and released, they would be given a card to wear on their clothes to show that they were allowed to come and go. Because Greenwood had been destroyed, there were no homes for people to go back to, so many of them had to remain on the fairground regardless of whether or not they'd been released. Now all of this isn't to say that every single white person in Tulsa agreed with the actions of the white mob. Lots of people did try to protect the black families, letting them take cover in their houses and help provide aid and food at the fairground. But sadly, this was the minority. This was still a mob of literally thousands of white people in a town that wasn't all that big at the time. It wasn't a small minority of the people who were rioters. The small minority were the people who were helping. The Red Cross arrived shortly after the violence subsided to help with a man called Maurice Willows arriving as an official. The Red Cross never usually conducted relief efforts for man-made disasters except for war, but they showed up in the aftermath of this massacre. Maurice decided that if the Red Cross didn't show up to help here, no one would. So it was actually the Red Cross that assisted with the food and shelter at the fairground here. They stayed for months helping wherever they could and probably limited the number of deaths in the aftermath hugely. These people were literally living in tents with no money and the Red Cross helped keep them alive. It didn't take long for the officials in Tulsa to start pushing their own narrative of what had actually happened here. And of course, that narrative was that it was the residents of Greenwood themselves who were responsible. Shock horror. When a grand jury were assembled to investigate, they were told that the crowd assembled outside the courthouse was not a mob, they were merely spectators and curiosity seekers. The assembly was apparently quiet until the arrival of the armed black men. And all of the white men involved in this riot were given immunity, of course. This remained the dominant narrative of what had happened in Tulsa until eventually it just faded from public memory. The city did everything they could to remove any public narrative of this. The fact that even the microfilms of the papers at the time are edited or just don't exist says a lot. Some city officials said they would rebuild Greenwood with the assistance of the Red Cross, but then they decided, no, they want to use that land for industry instead. Maurice Willows was actually the one who convinced the black landowners of Greenwood to not sell their land under any circumstances. Whilst they didn't have their homes, they still owned the land that the homes had stood on. In response to this, the city applied these crazy fire codes to the area which would have made it too expensive to ever rebuild there. But activists urged the residents to rebuild anyway, even though they could be arrested for doing so against city codes. The activist lawyers said they would pay bail for anyone arrested for rebuilding, they wanted to get Greenwood back. They then filed suit against the city for taking property without due process and they won, giving the neighbourhood a chance to rebuild properly once again. But then they faced another challenge in that insurance companies refused to pay out claims relating to the riot due to policy exemptions, and so followed an enduring argument over whether this was a riot or a massacre, and that's an important distinction. It took years, but the people who wanted to remain did eventually rebuild and Greenwood stood once again. And what happened to Dick Rowland in all of this? Well, it seems that he actually managed to escape the city in all of this drama, along with Sheriff McCullough. It's not really known what happened to him after that point. The prosecutors did drop all charges against him, reportedly at the request of Sarah Page. And little is also known about her after this point. She disappeared on June 1st and no real trace of her has really been found since. 
It's reported up to 300 people died as a result of this massacre, and there are numerous different reports as to what may have been done with these bodies. Some reports say the bodies were placed on trains and taken away from Tulsa. Some say that they were thrown into the Arkansas River or were burned. However, the most popular theory is that of mass graves, a piece of history which has spread down the generations orally, from people who were first-hand witnesses of it all. It's said that within just hours of the riots finally ending, workers, black workers of course, were put to work digging holes for mass graves in which these bodies were put unceremoniously. The search for these mass graves is still an ongoing investigation in modern day Tulsa ever since this commissioned report in 2001 brought the public's attention to them. Four potential burial sites were identified in the city's examination and a public oversight committee was established to ensure transparency throughout this investigation. The committee is made up of descendants of the people involved in the massacre and leaders in Tulsa's black community. It seems like around October 2020, they may have actually pinpointed one of these graves, finding a site containing at least 12 wooden coffins located near the headstones of the only two known buried massacre victims in Potter's Field at Oaklawn. They were then to begin work to determine if these remains were definitely connected to the massacre, which is obviously a big forensic undertaking. First, they have to get permits to exhume them and they have to go from there. There's a lot of bureaucracy involved in something like this. It doesn't seem like there have been many updates on this since then, since October 2020. So I've stuck on my Google Alerts to see if anything new comes out of this. And I suppose we'll just find out. Throughout this video, I've already referenced the commission that was put in place in 1996 to investigate what happened in these riots. They appointed individuals to study and prepare a report detailing a historic account of what happened. I've used said report a lot in my research for this video and of course it will be linked in my sources down below. It's a really great read and probably the most historically accurate version of events. Although please bear in mind what I said at the beginning of this video, the specifics of this are still speculated. All of the people who were involved are now dead 100 years later. The commission was originally called the Tulsa Race Riot Commission, but in 2018 they changed it to the Tulsa Race Massacre Commission. It delivered the final report in February 2001, 20 years ago, and recommended a number of restitutions to black residents, including direct payment of reparations to survivors, direct payment of reparations to the descendants of the survivors, a scholarship fund for students affected by the Tulsa Race Riot, establishment of an economic development enterprise zone in the historic area of the Greenwood district, and finally a memorial for the reburial of the remains of victims of the riot. So finally there was some kind of justice or at least restitution for the victims of this. Whilst we don't know the details, what has become pretty clear over the investigation in recent years is that black people were not responsible for the massacre against their own people. To me, the fact that Tulsa tried so hard to cover this up suggested that even they knew that at the time. The best way to honour the people who lost their lives is to now talk about this, to share their stories, make sure that it's no longer brushed under the carpet, make this story known because it wasn't for so many decades. I do not know and I will never know as a white person what the experiences of black people are in this world, all I can do is try to educate myself and help educate other people and we can all learn as a society from there. I know I say it all the time but I truly believe that education and knowledge is the key to unlocking acceptance and understanding within society. We will never know what it's like to walk in the shoes of somebody else, anybody else on this planet, whether it's somebody more privileged or less privileged than us. All we can do is try to listen and learn and take on board what other people say about their own experiences. That's all we can do. And I just think sharing stories like this is so important to learn what it's like. Thank you so much for watching this video. As always, if you've got any other requests for historical topics you would like me to talk about on my channel, then please leave them in the comments down below. I will see you on the next one. Bye guys.